The thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order, is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's story, Death Rides a Broomstick. Doctor? Yes, please, Miss Lane. Would you hold the lantern a little higher? That's it. Oh, oh. I'm trying to be as careful as possible, Mr. McCabry. I understand, Doctor. Go right ahead. Mr. Cranston, would you hand me those bandages now, please? Surely. Here you are. Uh, how is he, Doctor? I'm just dressing the wound now, Commissioner. I think we ought to learn just what this is all about. But, Commissioner, he's not in any condition to talk oh, now. I'm all right, Miss Lane. I'll explain everything right from the beginning. Uh. Then it'll all be very clear. Would you mind propping me up a bit, Doctor? Not at all. There you are. Thank you. My family, the McCavery clan, is an old, old family. And like many old families, there are many things in our past that we'd like to forget. Among them is the fact that many years ago, 1741 to be exact, my great-great-grandfather, Thad McCavery, chieftain of the clan McCavery, officiated at the execution of a woman condemned to be burned at the stake on a charge of witchcraft. It took place in the courtyard of the old castle, far up in the Scottish Highlands. And as the story goes, everyone in the township... There she is! They're turning the witch to the stake! Witch! Witch! Burn the witch! Burn the witch! Burn the witch! I burn her! Be it known to all that this woman, taken in the practice of black magic and known to be a sorceress in league with the powers of darkness and the evil one himself, is this day to be burned at the stake, that her remains may not be buried in hallowed ground, nor may any offer prayers for the peace of her soul. Her judge to and signed with the seal of the chieftain of the clan McCaffrey. Executioner, apply the torch. The torch! my witchcraft, then is the clan McCavery to feel the power of it. This day I curse you, McCavery, with a dying curse. I give you two hundred years from this day, and in the second month of the second century from this date, every male who bears the name of McCavery shall die a horrible death. By the end of that month, there shall be no man living with the name of the blood of a Caffrey. This I promise. Enough. Apply the torch. The curse. Apply the torch. The curse is on you. <laughs> the curse was nothing more to my Uncle Garth or my brothers Tom and Donald and myself than just an old wives' tale. A forgotten skeleton moldering in the family closet. Eh, but what has all this got to do with... Let him continue the story, Commissioner. Please go ahead, Mr. McCavery. Well, as you know, the family prospered through the years. My Uncle Garth, who took care of the finances, was custodian of over two million dollars. And none of us paid attention to the fact that 1941 was the 200th year of the curse. But at the beginning of this month, the second month, of the second century, things began to happen. Just past midnight, February 1st, on a small merchant vessel some 200 miles off the coast of Labrador. Our mate, snatched from the prime of life, whom we must leave behind us buried in a sea grave, shall hold a place in our hearts forever. May God in his goodness See fit to bring to him at last 
peace and bring him home to harbor. Amen. 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 Commit the coffin to the sea. Hoist away over the edge. May heaven so receive the soul of Thomas McCavery. <laughs> He was the first, the first to die. This was your brother? Yes, Miss Lane, my younger brother, Tom, dead at sea. I remember the night that I received word of his passing. Without knowing why, I found myself looking at a calendar. And for the first time in my life, I gave serious thought to the family curse. Later that evening, I paid a hurried visit to my brother Donald's apartment to bring him the fearful news. Oh, Jamie, come in. I was just writing to... Jamie, what's wrong? You're pale as a ghost. Donald, Tom is dead. Tom is dead? Yes, I just received a cable grant. Tom dead? Why, why no, that's impossible. It's to... true, Donald. But he was in the best of health. What happened? The cable just said, cause of death unknown. Cause of death unknown? Donald, do you... Do you know what month this is? Well, yes, it's February. Why? February is the second month of the second century. Well, what has that got to do with... Oh. Yes, I see what you mean. Well, now, Jamie, you don't think I that... do. I believe that the curse of the clan is now at work. Oh, come now, man. In this day and age, no one can believe that a story that's been handed down... <laughs> Donald, someone fired that shot from outside this window. Look. Look, they threw the gun in through the glass. Why in the name of heaven should... Look, it's mine. That's my gun. How in the Jamie. world did it... Jamie. Donald, what's the matter? I've been shot. Donald. <laughs> Donald! James McCabry. James McCabry. This court finds you guilty in the first degree of the murder of your brother Donald and sentences you to the state penitentiary where you will be imprisoned for life. I Say, officer, it's pretty stuffy in here. Would it be asking too much if we went out to the observation platform? You know, just for my last fresh air as a free man. Well, okay, McCaffrey. But no funny stuff. No, no funny stuff. Come along, then. But remember, you and me are going to be closer than Siamese twins till we get to the big house. I could hardly forget it with these handcuffs on. Oh, boy, that smells good. Cigarette? Thank you. Tell me something, will you? What's that? What come over a young guy like you to bump off your own brother? I didn't kill him. Now, nah, look, Buster, you aren't talking to the judge now. You were found with your gun in your hand. The door locked and you were trying to smash your way out the window. What does that look like, a tea party? I repeat that I didn't kill him, so don't ask me any more questions, please. Okay, okay. Have it your own way. Well, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening. It's lovely weather, isn't it? These days are getting longer. I'll have time to put around in my garden before the light's gone. You fond of gardening? No. It's excellent for the health. Yeah, yeah, I know. I specialize in hydrangeas. You, you like them? Yes and no. Oh, it's a beautiful flower. Last season, they didn't do well for me at all at first. Oh? No. no, I used some of Dr. Webb's silica extract on them, and did you, you know what? No, what? There's a gun in my left-hand pocket that's going to blast a hole right through your midsection any second now. What? Yes, so I'll just bet you're going to be a good boy and unlock those handcuffs, aren't you? I don't get you. Unlock them. Sure. Sure, okay. Say, who are you? They call me the Smiler. Well, well, what's this all about? You'll find out after we're off this train, Jimmy. Now, over the side with you. Well, after getting me off the train, the Smiler took me to my Uncle Garth's home. Oh, but I, I guess, Lamont, that you and Miss Lane know the story from there on. Yes, Jimmy. Margo and I were driving out to your uncle's. Margo was asking me why I had to... Lamont, will you tell me why you picked the dead of night to pay a call on the McCabry mansion? Well, Margo, I thought old Garth might need a little cheering up. This trouble between his nephews has hit the old boy pretty hard. Wait, 
This looks like the turn here. Yes, I remember those big stone gates. Lamont, it, is that the Macabre Mansion? That Karloff Castle? <laughs> yes. Old Garth lives there all alone. I wouldn't say that. What do you mean? He must have any number of ghosts to keep him company in that weird old place. <laughs> it is a bit spooky looking, isn't it? That's an understatement. Well, here we are. <laughs> yes, here we are. Shall we put our sheets on now? <laughs> now, Margie, you're going to like old Garth. He isn't like his house at all. Well, if he is, I'm going right home. <laughs> Gee, Lamont, it's so dark I can't see a thing. Well, just hold on to my arm. Front door's right over here. How are you finding it? By the Braille system? Uh-huh. <laughs> here we are. I don't see any lights on in the house. And Garth's rooms are upstairs at the rear. Oh. Yeah, it's enough to wake the dead, I guess. Lamont, could you possibly use a more cheerful figure of speech? Oh, oh Wellesley, the butler is usually very prompt in answering the door. I don't understand what's keep. Oh. Good evening. Is that you, Wellesley? Who? Oh? Is that Mr. McCavery? McCavery? I'm sorry I can't see you. It's so dark. Who did you wish to see? Mr. Garth McCavery. Sorry, but there's no one here but me. And uh, who are you, may I ask? I'm known to my friends as the Smiler. Well, uh, this is the McCavery Mansion, isn't it? No, no, I'm sorry. I imagine you've lost your way. You've gotten mixed up. Good night. What in the blaze? This is the McCavery Mansion. I've been here dozens of times. But, Lamont, why should that oh, Wait man... a minute. If this is the place, there'll be a little family graveyard just within a clump of trees near the car. Uh-oh, here we go again. Let's do a little deducting. If we're looking for a graveyard now, I hope we are in the wrong estate. All in all, this has been a fine night. What with... Lamont, you were right. There's the graveyard. Yes, of course. I knew this was the place. Look. That grave in the middle, the one with the big stone, it, it's all dug up. Yes, so it is. So it is. Margot, I'm afraid we've got a flat tire. What are you talking about? We've got a flat tire, and we're going to ask our rude gentleman friend to let us use his phone. We're going to get into that house at once. <laughs> Will Lamont and Margot succeed in getting into the house? We'll find out in just a moment. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. <laughs> the thrilling adventures of the shadow are on the air. These dramatizations are designed to demonstrate forcibly to old and young alike that crime does not pay. The shadow, mysterious character who aids the forces of law and order is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. As the shadow, Cranston is gifted with hypnotic power to cloud men's minds so that they cannot see him. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the voice of the invisible shadow belongs. Today's drama, one of the shadow's most thrilling adventures, Murder from the Grave. <laughs> That's him there, walking towards the corner. Yeah. Pulling closer to the curb. Okay, okay. Wait till we're right beside him, see? Yeah, I know. All right, let him have it. Right over here, Doc. All right. Well, here he is, what there is left of him. Yeah. They did a pretty complete job, officer. Yeah, he must have stopped every slug they threw at him. He's still breathing, though, and I don't know why. Well, we better get him to the hospital at once. Here, give me a hand with him, will you? Okay, but it looks to me like a waste of time. Well, what's the story, Doc? DOA, officer. Dead on arrival. Yeah, I figured that. Well, better make out any part. You want to send him to the city morgue or hold him here at the hospital? I'll check headquarters and find out. Yes. Gangster, isn't he? Might say so. 
Do you recognize him at all? Now, how can I answer that? The guy ain't got hardly no face left, has he? Hey, good evening, Dr. Henry. Oh, hello, Dr. Metzger. What brings you down here to the receiving room? Uh, just keeping in touch with the activities of the hospital. Well, what have you there? A gang shooting, Doctor. He seems to be well perforated. Yes, especially the face. It's been just about shot away. Yes, so I see. He died on the way to the hospital. So, uh, mind if I have a look at him? No, Doctor. No, go ahead. I'm going to use your phone, Doc. I'll be right back. All right, officer. Dr. Henry. Yes? Did I understand you to say that you have pronounced this man dead? Why, why yes, Doctor. I'm afraid you were mistaken. What? This man is still alive. Well, Dr. Metzger, I couldn't feel any pulse, yeah, no heartbeat. I tell heartbeat. you, he is alive. Ring for the elevator at once. But, Doctor, what I tell I you... Say, I... This man is to be brought to my laboratory. Hurry, Doctor, there's no time to lose. Dr. Henry speaking. Hello, this is Dr. Metzger. Oh, yes, Doctor. That patient, the man who was brought to my laboratory, is alive and can be saved. Why, why that's unbelievable, Doctor. Nevertheless, it is true. But... What about his face? His face has been shot away, Doctor. I intend to give him a new face. Now, listen to me, Dr. Henry. I want a general order given to all in the hospital that I am not to be disturbed for the next six weeks. Uh, Yes, sir. All of my meals and any surgical instruments or supplies that I might need are to be left outside of my door for that period. You understand? Uh, Yes, Dr. Metzger. If these orders are carried out, I can tell you now, Henry, that in six weeks' time, I will bring forth a man who is whole again. Doggone it, Jack. I just can't help it. Old man curiosity is getting the better of him. And you've got to find out what goes on in Metzger's laboratory. Is that it? Yes. <laughs> He's been in there almost six weeks now, Jack. Imagine almost six weeks without telling anyone how his experiment is progressing. Say, does anyone even know if the patient is still alive? Yes, we do know that much. Metzger sent word to that effect to Doc Hawkins yesterday. <laughs> Look, Sherlock, how do you plan to get into the laboratory? Well, when Metzger opens the door for this tray of food, uh-huh. I'll just walk in with him, that's all. Good luck. Yes, I'll need it. Uh, knock on the door for me, will you? Sure. Hmm? Who is there? Your food tray, Dr. Metzger. Oh, thank you. Uh, where do you want me to uh, put... Uh, one moment. You believe the tray with me, Dr. Henry? Oh, I was just going you to put... You were just going to try to gain entrance to my laboratory. <laughs> I'm aware of your intense curiosity, Henry. A curiosity that is shared by everyone else in this hospital. Ah, well. You can tell them all for me that my experiment is nearing completion. Very well, Doctor. If they wish, if they wish, they may come here to my laboratory tomorrow at noon. (laughs) And I shall reveal to them my finished product. I don't know what we're waiting for. Uh, Uh, Dr. Metzger asked us all to be here at noon today. It's now quarter after. I, for one, see no reason for waiting around any longer. You're right, Henry. Well, what'll we do? Well, we'll let them know we're here. Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger. Why doesn't he answer? Well, there's only one way to find that out, and that's by trying to get in. The door isn't locked. I'll go look for him. Uh, Dr. Metzger. Dr. Metzger? He must be in there. He's not out here. Good Lord. Come here, all of you. What's oh, what is it? Look. Look, there on the floor. Oh, holy. It's Metzger. He's dead. Yes. And it looks like murder. His face has been slashed. Look, here on the floor. A broken mirror. Where's the patient, the man he was working on? There was no one else in this room when I came in. Well, then he's gone. Yes, but not before he murdered Dr. Metzger. And since that time, Lamont, the police have learned nothing. Well, that's understandable, Dr. Hawkins. They really have nothing to work on. You have no idea what this Mr. X looks like, have you, Dr. Hawkins? No, we haven't, Margot. Dr. Metzger did a plastic job on his face, changed it completely. That's all we know. Well, it's been 24 hours since the killing. The man has had ample time to get away and cover up his tracks. Yes. I don't see how Lamont can do any more than the police have done, Doctor. Uh, I didn't ask Lamont to come here for that purpose, Margot. Oh, no? No, I... Well, I discovered something in Dr. Metzger's laboratory that I haven't even told the police about. Well, why not? Because it's something too fantastic for them to believe. Well, what is it, Doctor? Metzger's personal notebook in which he recorded the progress of his experiment. I have it right here. What does this notebook contain? Well, the first entry was written the night the patient arrived in the hospital. Dr. Metzger wrote in the notebook at that time... Tonight, I have at last been given the opportunity... 
that I have been so patiently waiting for. The perfect subject for my experiment is at this very moment lying on a table before me. I have given him the first injection of the solution. The reaction was most successful. Now the real work begins. What does all that mean, Dr. Hawkins? You learn later, Lamont. Just as I learned as I read further into the notes. The next entry of any importance came a week later. At that time, the doctor wrote... Everything is progressing satisfactorily. Today, the patient has sufficient strength for me to begin the plastic work. I have found that best results can be obtained by giving injections of the solution every 24 hours. This is most important. Any period of time beyond this is dangerous. Well, what is the solution that he keeps talking about? I'm coming to that, Margot. I'll skip over the entries that follow. They deal mainly with a growing conflict between the patient and Metzger. A note of regret creeps into his writing. You sense that he's almost sorry for the work that he's done. Eventually, this conflict flames to open hatred. And in the last entry, written the night before he died, Dr. Metzger wrote... May heaven have mercy on me for ever conceiving this work that I have done. The patient has now reverted to the vicious being that he has always been. Instead of having gratitude for what I have done, he shows only resentment. Tomorrow morning, I shall remove the bandages that cover his face. He has threatened me that if he is not pleased with my work, dire consequences will result. This, then, is the fruit of my labor. This is the price I pay for my great discovery. My discovery of a solution that literally brought a dead man back to life again. A solution with which... So that's it. That was the secret solution. Yes. But that's unbelievable, Dr. Hawkins. A solution that brings the dead back to life? Metzger was a great scientist. Nothing was impossible to him. Well, where is the solution now? I couldn't find it. I've searched everywhere in the laboratory. Then it's evident that the patient, knowing about it, took it with him. I'm afraid so. Well, I'd say you had good cause for alarm, Doctor. This killer who is now at large is a man returned from the dead. A man without a soul. Yes, it's true. But uh, tell me, Lamont, have you gotten any clues from what you've just learned? Only one. The broken mirror that was found near the doctor's body. Obviously, this mirror must have been shattered by the missing man. Why do you say that? He must have broken it in rage when he first saw his new face. Metzger must have made him sufficiently horrible to bring on this rage. So we have only one clue to work on. A man with an incredibly ugly face. Dr. Hawkins! Dr. Hawkins! What is it? What is it? Come in. Dr. Hawkins, something terrible has happened. Well, what's wrong? In the morgue. The hospital morgue, just a few minutes ago. Yes, what happened? A man with a gun came in, forced me to take one of the bodies, a dead body, out to a car. What? I... I had to obey. Why didn't you call out for help? I... I was about to until I saw his face. His face, Dr. Hawkins. It was the most frightening thing I've ever seen. It wasn't human. Doctor, I'd say our killer has made his first move, and I fear that it won't be his last. Ooh. 